Right, so a few weeks ago, I took a look at a bunch of crappy ways to play great games. A premise of a video that seemed to do well, and one that people really seemed to enjoy watching. And I am nothing if a bit of a greedy trollop when it comes to views and engagement, which got me looking back at even more ways you can potentially ruin your gaming experiences. As was the case with the last video, this isn't any kind of definitive or complete list. And I'm also not trying to throw shade at any of these games directly. In fact, for pretty much every game in this video, I'd wholeheartedly recommend you seek them out and play them yourself. You know, just not in the manner in which I cover here. With all that in mind, let's go back in there one more time and check out even more worse ways to play the best games. Now, if I ever had to sit down and go through the top five first-person shooters of all time, I'm absolutely certain I'd be putting Monolith Productions Fear onto that list. Easily one of the most visceral, cathartic, and stylish shooters ever made. It was a fantastic combination of all that action and psychological horror. Putting you into the shoes of a reflex-gifted super soldier. Taken on genetically enhanced clones and a murderous psychic in the form of a nightmare-inducing little girl. Originally influenced by the John Moo action films of the 80s and the 90s, it then went on to influence an entire generation of games for decades to come, with even recent indie titles showing off some of its hallmarks. So naturally, it made sense that they would have ported this to the two biggest gaming consoles at the time, which is what they did when the game was released for the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3. With the 360 version coming out in 2006 and the PS3 version a year after that in 2007. Top secret, of course. And while the Xbox 360 version is mostly stable and a pretty decent way to play that original game, the PS3 port is another great example of just how challenging that console really used to be for developers. This is the worst! Initially things start off pretty well though, with the opening cutscene actually looking pretty smooth. But once you start to actually get into the gameplay, you'll notice just how sluggish the frame rate is. With the whole thing chugging along, even when you're not in combat and just walking around all these empty environments. This PS3 version runs at 720p, which is obviously making that image look a lot blurrier. And weirdly as well, like the bullet time effect seems to amplify this. Whereas on the PC, bullet time seemed to make the image sharper, kind of highlighting the point man's heightened reflexes and those razor sharp reaction times. Oh my god! Here though, it's kind of like the dudes had one too many four locos. Certain levels are even split up now, which is fine, but this version also comes with some absolutely ridiculous loading times, with a few of them being almost a minute long. But even just like the basic controls here feel utterly awful, with the game having what might be the most aggressive aiming acceleration I think I've ever seen. Where it goes from a normal turning speed to Mark fucking 3 within a split second. Oh man, oh god, oh man! And the barely existent aiming assist ain't making things any easier either. I mean, look, like, I genuinely don't know what kind of person actually enjoys aiming acceleration. To be honest, I don't want to know. But either way, man, like, if you're going to include it in your game, at least give the option to turn it off. You know, along with the option to modify the button mapping as well. Something which fear sadly lacks here. And something that there's no excuse for either. And despite there being like half a dozen different preset control schemes, none of them are really any good. Eventually I picked a layout where R2 was fire, L1 was slow-mo and L2 was melee. Along with a circle button being for medkits, square being for reloading, and down on the D-pad turning my flashlight on and off. That doesn't make sense. I mean, yeah, that was the one that I thought was the least confusing. Now does any of this stuff really affect how fear plays on the whole? Well, I mean, no, not in a massive way. And at the end of the day, you're still more or less getting the exact same game that people got on the PC. You know, in the sense that they've not removed any of the levels, the weapons, or any of that kind of stuff. But I look at the whole thing this way. Is the quality of the port negatively affecting how you are experiencing the whole thing? And if the answer is yes, well, then it's probably not worth your time and you should be looking at alternate methods. 
If we look at that version on the Xbox 360, for instance, it suffers from none of these kinds of issues. And in fact, too, like it even adds in unique weapons with the new submachine guns, which can even be dual wielded, you know, giving it at least some kind of novelty value. Plus, it's also backwards compatible with the Xbox Series X. On the PS3, though, this is just a vastly inferior version of the same game. A game which otherwise still runs really well on the PC and is pretty much dirt cheap to pick up. Along with it being a shooter that is ridiculously fun to play. Being one of the few that lets you turn someone into a fine red mist through shotgun surgery. Next up, we're going back to Half-Life 2 again, I mean, kind of, with Episode 2 and the Orange Box in 2007. Oh, what a storm. And I don't think I really need to spend too much time here talking about the virtues of Half-Life 2 in that regard. Anyone who was around back then really remembers the hype and the impact that this one had on the industry. And there's a reason why it's still talked about so fondly even to this day. Along with it also being really obvious now that Valve clearly doesn't give a shit in regards to making a Half-Life 3. It's also just kind of hard to overstate how much of a big deal the Orange Box was at the time too. I mean, not only were you getting all of Half-Life 2 in Episode 1, but Valve are also throwing in the brand new Episode 2, as well as the much anticipated Team Fortress 2 and a game called Portal, which is a smaller title that, you know, barely anyone played. Oh, by the way, I was being sarcastic. 2007 in general really just was one of those great years for gaming too. I mean, we got the first Assassin's Creed, Call of Duty 4, Crisis, Super Mario Galaxy, Bioshock, and Halo 3 to name just a few. It was also when console gaming was at an all-time peak, which made perfect sense for the Orange Box to be released on the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3, with the latter yet again being the far weaker choice. No shit. And you know, honestly, like, I could probably fill an entire video talking about PS3 versions of games being the worst possible way to play them. But, you know, I'll try to limit it to just these two. And again, like with Fear, this is another instance where the controls really are the whole thing's downfall. With some truly awful aiming acceleration being at the forefront of why this thing feels so miserable to play. Again, along with a complete lack of aim assist. At least this time though, you do get the options to customize those button layouts, which is already a huge improvement. But still, like this controls are noticeably worse than the Xbox 360 version does. And it really is kind of baffling as to how this has happened. Now when it comes to actually running each game, truthfully, Half-Life 2 and Episode 1 aren't all that bad. I mean, like it could be better, but in the case of Half-Life 2, it's perfectly acceptable. And it's a damn sight better than trying to play that crappy old Xbox port. Episode 2 though, now that's a completely different kettle of fish. And right from those opening chapters, the performance here is considerably worse. Yeah. Which also brings back those aforementioned control issues to light, considering that combined with the stuttering frame rate, it makes accurate shots even trickier. The times when it seems to be at its worst is whenever you're doing something that's directly interacting with the physics engine. The thing is though, you know, seeing as this game is almost entirely physics based, you can see how that's going to be a huge issue. Definitely peaks during the driving sequences and when you're up against that hunter chopper and have to fling back those explosive mines with the gravity gun. Where it almost feels like the controller and that frame rate is a bit of an outright handicap. The long and short of it is that Half-Life is a PC-centric series. It always has been. And the first and the second game were developed specifically for PCs with the mouse and keyboard as a control scheme first in mind. And while they might have been ported to consoles like Half-Life was to the PS2, those versions had to make some pretty noticeable changes to accommodate the new controls. Which is why the PS2 port had a really useful lock-on system, and then Half-Life 2 and the Xbox added in aim assist. It's also why trying to do certain activities and movements in Episode 2 feels awkward and clunky, because these sequences weren't designed with the notion that someone's going to be doing it with a goddamn controller. I mean, it wasn't even until 2022 when Valve finally added official controller support to these games. And even then, that was only due to constant backlash from the fans. 
so yeah, like I guess my point is if you want to play these games in the worst possible way, well, then the orange box on the PS3 is kind of perfect. But again, like Fear, like there's really no reason to ever play this version of the game, considering that all of these are easy to pick up on the PC and still play incredibly well on modern computers. The right man in the wrong place can make all the difference, sure, but the wrong port in the wrong place should just be put in the trash. Now I know this next one is kind of low hanging fruit, but if we're talking about the worst ways to play the best games, how can I not talk about the absolutely dreadful GTA Definitive Edition? Released back in 2021. 2021? Shit. Times are changing. Yeah, more perfect timing that was as well. I mean, 20 years after GTA 3 had first been unleashed on the gaming world and changed the landscape of the industry for years to come. And the whole thing seemed really promising, like update the game for modern consoles and introduce these old classics to an entirely new generation of players. Should have been a sure thing, right? What could possibly go wrong? Only it wasn't, and for some reason Rockstar thought it would be a good idea to palm off all these responsibilities for this so-called definitive edition to a team whose only real credits included working on mobile ports. Motherfucker! Yeah, along with the team who left Lorem Ipsum text on their website. So, yeah, suffice to say, things didn't go too well. This is a disaster. I still remember when this whole thing first launched, and I literally couldn't play through certain missions when it started to rain. Because that original effect that the game had on launch just made me feel like I was going to projectile vomit across the room. But it also came with a whole lib of other so-called visual updates, which in more ways than not, completely ruined how the games looked and with a very definition of soulless. With lots of flat, generic texture work and completely different colours and lighting that just ruined the mood and tone. <laughs> as well as that, with San Andreas, like, I guess someone forgot to calculate the view distance fog or something. And from those high vantage points, you could see the entirety of the map, you know, removing any sense of scale or vastness it used to have. There was also a bit of evidence there that AI had been used to update certain things, with text and imagery often being incorrect or just complete gibberish. And it overall butchered the art style of those original three games, games which truly each had their own unique aesthetics. It really just felt like someone threw the whole thing into the Unreal Engine 4 and called it a day, which, you know, is probably what they did. Man, hell no! I can't take this shit much longer! Man. Worse than that too, the game didn't even work on PC for the first few days after launch, due to the Rockstar Games launcher having a complete shit fit. Oh yeah, and due to licensing issues, a lot of music from the radio stations couldn't be included as well, which, you know, is a bit of an outright travesty considering how iconic some of those tracks are. But the worst thing about all of this is that since Rockstar have delisted those original versions on Steam, buying the Definitive Edition is the only way you're able to experience these games on PC legally. You better keep on running, asshole! I mean, at that point, you're genuinely better off going back and just playing through the originals on the PlayStation 2 or the Xbox. And if you can somehow still get your hands on the PC versions, the modding scene has made these versions infinitely better too. Now I know that they have gone back and fixed a lot of these issues over the years and look, I've got no doubt that it's in a much more playable state in 2024, but much like dropping off a post-grog bog, the damage has still been done. Now you might be a little bit surprised seeing me talking about a fighting game for this next one, you know, considering the kind of titles I usually talk about, but the fact of the matter is that the 90s was an absolute golden era for this genre, and it was kind of impossible to be into gaming and not be into fighters and beat-em-ups as well. And without a doubt, what's one of the all-time best fighting game franchises in that regard is the Marvel vs. Capcom series. Starting originally with X-Men vs. Street Fighter back in 1997, through to the recent Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite in 2017. It was just a series of games that you'd always see pop up in pretty much every single local arcade worth its salt. And thankfully, I was lucky enough to own all of these games on the PS1 back when they first launched. Which is good, you know, considering nowadays you need to take out a second mortgage if you want to pick them up. <laughs> Anyway, the absolute peak of the series for me has always been the third game, Clash of Heroes, the one that came out in 1999. Marvel vs. Capcom! 
This is great! And I can remember many after-school afternoons spent huddled around that arcade cabinet, desperately trying to fight my way through to that final showdown against Onslaught. <laughs> People might say that the best hero team up of all time is Wolverine and Deadpool, but I say fuck that. It's all about Wolverine and Mega Man. Now, whereas the Dreamcast port was a near-perfect arcade conversion, the one for the PlayStation was not. And due to the memory limitations of the console, that ability to swap back and forth between characters was almost completely removed, which was truly something that was one of the best aspects to every game in this series. Being able to create these ludicrous team-ups like Spider-Man and Captain Commando, and then tagging out when things got too heated. Instead, what this PS1 version did was let you choose which of these characters you could have as an assist, with that then also replacing the mechanic of the special partners. Yeah, the special partners being that wacky little list of cameos you could call in for a quick assist, like Cyclops from the X-Men or Arthur from Ghosts and Goblins. This also meant as well that unlike the Dreamcast and the arcade version where you could have both, now you're either choosing to call in that other character for an assist or one of the special partners, really making this PS1 version kinda gimped. Now, this isn't the first time this has happened either, considering that both X-Men vs. Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter both suffered from the same affliction. In fact, there's even new loading screens that had to be added in between each match as well, whereas the Dreamcast version is more or less instant. <laughs> What I think is even sadder is that even the Sega Saturn was able to pull this feature off. You know, assuming of course you had the expansion pack and the Japanese versions for both games. Because for some reason, Capcom never saw fit to release either of these outside of Japan. Now in the PS1's defense, there is a crossover mode which does bring this feature back in, kind of. And the reason that I say kind of is that the catch here is that each side has to have chosen the same characters. Which just completely ruins the whole point of the game. And greatly simplifies all the various combinations and team-ups you could possibly have. But I don't know, like maybe it's the nostalgia me or something? Because despite this being an objectively inferior version of the game, I still really enjoy playing through it. <laughs> And I do think that visually as well, the PS1 port looks sharper and even more colourful than the Dreamcast version. And you know what, like any game that lets me put Morrigan and Chun-Li side by side, and offers up that much side thigh sprite work, is alright my books. Morrigan, win! <laughs> Now, back in the day, if there was ever a game that got released for both the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation, well, it was usually the version for the PlayStation that ended up being the weaker one. And that was absolutely the case for games like South Park, Armourines, and Mortal Kombat 4. Scorpion wins. The fuck is that? However, there were a few exceptions to that rule, with titles like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, Toy Story 2, and case in point, Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 2. What the fuck did you just fucking say about me, you little bitch? Now, released in 1999, a year after this had originally come out on the PS1, it's a heavily modified version of the original. Actually developed too by Rockstar San Diego, back when they called themselves Angel Studios. <laughs> I do want to say though, despite this being a downgrade in almost every single area, this is actually an amazing port and an incredible achievement that it even works to begin with. Especially considering that the original game was split across two CDs and somehow these guys have got it all working on a single cartridge. With both Claire and Leon's campaign being available and the game not even needing a memory pack to save. However, this does mean that some pretty big sacrifices have had to be made, really in just the extreme compression that's occurred with almost every single element of the game's presentation, from the visuals and the audio through to those pre-rendered cinematics, which are now about the lowest possible bitrate I think is humanly possible. Wait, don't shoot! Get down! <laughs> And the whole thing really does look just so dull and muted, especially when juxtaposed with the PS1 where everything is sharp and vivid and with a much higher contrast.
probably the biggest difference here is just the textures for everything. I can't take the pain. With the 64 version looking substantially blurrier in that regard, especially when it comes to all those close-ups with all the various characters. What was that all about? If you're playing with an expansion pack, you can run the game at a whopping 480i resolution. But then that also brings in some problems of its own, where you'll often see the game randomly swapping back and forth between resolutions during certain scenes. One of the benefits this version does have though is the faster loading times, being that it's loading from a cartridge and not a CD. And it also has the option for different violent settings too, easily making it one of the goriest games for the platform. Which is kind of funny considering that this game came out around the same time as Pokemon Snap. Well done. There's even a setting in there to change the color of the blood as well, with the idea being that it could be moderated by an adult or something, which I think is hilarious considering I don't know anyone who had parents that would even remotely give a shit about that stuff. I don't give a rat's ass. Oh. <laughs> Also, if you managed to beat both the A and B campaigns for Claire and Leon, there was even a whole unique randomizer mode thrown in as well, which messed around with various elements of the game, something which is totally unique for this version. So yes, like looking at the whole thing on paper, this thing is far from being a bad port, and a pretty stellar technological marvel if you really think about it. No! And if this video is about impressive ports, well, then this thing would be right at the top of the list. But you know, it's not. It's about the worst ways to play the best games. And at the end of the day, like, this is still something this 64 port is unfortunately guilty of. Especially when compared to the original PS1 version. Not a good time to lose one's head. And to make it look even more dated, you could compare it to the Source Next version, which, when modded, is undoubtedly the best way to experience RE2. Either way though, you know what? This is still Resident Evil fucking 2 at the end of the day. And if this was the way you first got to experience Claire and Leon having the worst day of their lives, you know, aside from the time Leon turned down casual sex with a 20 year old. How rude! Well, then it could have been a damn sight worse. And that jump scare in the interrogation room with the liquor still somehow manages to always make my asshole leap up into my throat, regardless of the platform that it's on. Next up is what might be the most underrated game in this entire list, with acclaimed studio Shadow Man, released in 1999. Based off the comic book of the same name about a guy who sees and kills dead people. I hate this shit. And a game that, up until recently, I'm ashamed to say I didn't even really know existed. Okay, okay. Let's just get this thing over with. Right, so the story in this one is pretty damn fucking metal. It opens up with Jack the Ripper being confronted by a demon identifying himself as Legion. Yeah, not the cringy internet subculture kind of Legion either. Anyway, Legion convinces Jack to kill himself, lol, so he can cross over to a place called the Dead Side, to then construct an asylum for all the murderers, rapists, and used car salesmen of the underworld. Amen to that. Playing as the eponymous Shadow Man, a dude named Michael Leroy, your job is to then also cross over to the Dead Side, finding and absorbing Dark Souls before Legion can, which the guy would have used to create this powered up army of undead killers. The game opens up with our boy Mike lying in bed post coitus with a badass voodoo bitch named Nettie, and then with him having to kill himself on purpose so he can cross over as well. Okay, okay, so I really gotta get to the Dark Souls before the bad guy. From there on it becomes a sort of Metroidvania light, where you explore all these different areas of Deadside, with wastelands, temples, and the eventual asylum itself. Along with collecting Dark Souls along the way, improving Mike's powers so he can unlock all these various coffin gates. There's a bunch of video items to find here as well from all these different weapons through to items that gave you new abilities, like being able to push back firewalls or climb up bloodfalls. All topped off with an insanely cool aesthetic and vibe, really feeling like this surreal nightmarish limbo where ghastly and deformed creatures are constantly attacking you. Even the audio design and music was top-notch stuff, sounding like something out of those early Thief games, which is even more hilarious considering the guy who composed the music in this would eventually go on to work on the Bloons games. Impressive. Very nice. Having said all of that nice stuff though, like it was also a very repetitive game. And it quickly got into a rhythm of just going back to old areas to try to find more Dark Souls so you could level up and unlock that next coffin gate. 
Still though, you can't really deny that this thing was incredibly unique, and there really was nothing else quite like it at the time. Your feelings mutual. With there being three versions for three different consoles, with one for the Sega Dreamcast, Nintendo 64, and the PlayStation 1. Now the Dreamcast version is by far the best looking version, with the 64 being not too far behind it. And in fact, I think I actually prefer playing it on the 64, simply because it seems to control a lot smoother. He's right, you know. Either way though, that makes the PS1 version the clear cut loser here. And it really is actually kind of shocking just how worse off it is in comparison to the others. The most obvious difference here is gonna be the graphics, which when looked at side by side with the others is clearly a significant downgrade. And when it's in motion, you can see that the PS1 version chugs along at a much lower frame rate too, suffering a lot from all those typical performance issues. It's obviously running on a completely different engine or at least something that's been heavily modified, and while I usually appreciate the charm of PS1 era graphics, you know, with all the polygon wobbling and that kind of stuff, here the whole thing just looks kind of awful. Think again, fucker. Okay, okay. More than that, a lot of the level architecture has been modified as well, often greatly simplified, and the enemy count is also lower overall, making this version a lot easier. To make it worse, all of the ambient noise and that stuff that would play throughout certain areas is just completely gone, replaced by the depressing sound of silence. And a lot of Mike's one-liners, like when he'd smash down a new coffin gate, is also weirdly missing. Which really doesn't make any kind of sense, you know, given that stuff is still there on the 64 version, but not here. I don't care! Then there's issues with the basic controls, with the lock-on mechanic not really working consistently. And I also noticed that you jump higher in this version too, which for certain areas means you don't even have to worry about mantling up ledges and can just clear the jump in one go. I feel like if this game had have come out in 2024, everyone would be talking about the differences between the 64 and the PS1. But the thing is, like back then in the 90s, people didn't really seem to care all that much about this stuff. You know, certainly not the average gamer anyway. So yeah, like if mum or dad picked up this one for that trusty family console, you could have totally gone your whole life and never known that it was this bad. But there is still a reason why this version has the lowest aggregate score out of all of them. I hate this shit. As for actually playing it now, well, this is luckily one of those games that got the Night Dive Studios remaster treatment, making even the 64 and the Dreamcast versions kind of redundant. Well, I say kind of, again, because despite this remaster making some objective improvements in regards to presentation and controls, it also messes around a fair bit with the flow of the campaign adding in entirely new levels, new boss fights, along with moving around key items and enemies. Huh? What in the name of so I'm not sure if I'd say that this is the best way to play the game, considering it's not really the original game in that regard. But if nothing else, I will say that it's easily the most accessible. And I can still say with complete confidence that the PlayStation version is the worst way to play it. And you can take that statement to the goddamn bank. Bitch. Amen to that. And that brings us on to the last game in the video, and one that's still as relevant as ever, with the Silent Hill HD Collection. I think you better stay away. Released in 2012 for PS3 and the Xbox 360. And this thing right here is one of the all-time most notorious remasters ever made. And really, I think one of the earliest instances when people started to realize that Konami probably don't give that much of a shit about their own franchises. What happened here anyway? <laughs> What you're getting here with this HD collection is a so-called remastered version of both Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3, updated to run in widescreen, along with a whole list of other various improvements and additions, one of which includes updated voice work for both games. You. It was you, wasn't it? And I don't think I need to say too much about this one in that regard, because anyone who was into gaming around that time can probably remember all the drama that it caused, and even now it's still kind of infamous for just how half-assed it was. Okay, I got it. Eventually they did release a patch to fix a bunch of those issues, but the thing is that even after installing the latest update, something my console made me do before I could even play the game, I gotta say that both of these are still rife with problems. <sighs> Oh yeah, and despite all the graphical changes they've made, someone still saw fit to leave in that infamous Silent Hill sign with the Comic Sans font. My god, who could have? 
While all of that new voice acting may be optional, it truly is worth playing through Silent Hill 2 with this stuff turned on, just to hear how crappy it all sounds in comparison to the original. Anyway? What do you mean, anyway? You don't sound very happy to see me. Anyway? What do you mean, anyway? You don't sound very happy to see me. You. I mean, even bringing in Troy Baker here to voice James couldn't help them out. You snotty little brat, open up! And yeah, like I know that the original didn't really have stellar voice acting either, but I always felt like there was a deliberate awkwardness to the way that those certain characters talked, trying to emphasize the dreamlike nature of the world itself. I'm kind of lost. Lost? English, motherfucker, do you speak it? Yes! I also feel like this HD version looks way darker than the original does. And again, like, I know the original wasn't exactly brimming with bright colors, rainbows, or candy canes, but then again, like, it definitely didn't look this flat either. I got a letter. The name on the envelope said, Mary. I got a letter. The name on the envelope said, Mary. When you get to the actual gameplay, you'll quickly notice just how choppy the performance is as well, which seems to occur the most when you're outside running around in the streets. Just like this version doesn't seem to take advantage of the updated hardware, and load times when entering rooms is often on par, if not longer than it was on the PS2. I also noticed a bunch of other visual glitches, like shadows not working properly during certain cutscenes. Ha ha. Hey, hey, wait! Damn it. Ha <laughs> ha! Hey, wait! Damn it! And during that sequence where Marie is killed by Pyramid Head while trying to make it to the elevator... No! no! The guy just glitched out entirely and was off in the background, A, posing the entire time. James! No! <laughs> James! <gasps> and again, all of this stuff is happening after installing the patch. What? Oh yeah, and the worst part is that Silent Hill 3 seems to fare even worse. Because for this one, you're not even given the option to choose between the new or the old voice acting. Stuck entirely with all of this newer stuff. Get the hell away from me! Get the hell away from me! Get the hell away from me! We did 20 ticks, and that was the best one. Performance-wise as well, it often runs as poorly, if not worse than even Silent Hill 2 did. With the stuttering being far more noticeable, and often downright distracting. What I also noticed as well was that almost during every single cutscene, the whole thing was out of sync, with the dialogue being like a second or so behind the animations, which made the whole thing very irritating to sit through. Are you still following me? Do I have to scream? Sorry. I'll wait here. These cutscenes also lack some of those basic visual effects that even the PlayStation 2 was able to pull off with things like the depth of field, making the whole image again seem very plain and flat. My daddy always told me not to talk to strangers. So about the only objective visual improvement is that this one is added in that widescreen option. But if that's coming at the expense of all those other cinematic elements and the performance, then it's kind of like, what's the point? You may as well just play it on a PS2. I don't know any more than you do. Assuming of course you wanted to begin with, and your mortgage isn't overdrawn from having picked up X-Men vs Street Fighter. Which means that far and away the best way to play that second game is on the PC with the fan-made enhanced edition. With the PC port for the third game also being pretty stable after a few patches. If you got a copy of this one for the Xbox 360, well again, just like Fear and Half-Life 2, you'll be happy to know it's backwards compatible with the Xbox Series X. What a nightmare. So you can experience this absolute train wreck without having to dust off that old Doritos and semen encrusted 360 controller. You don't sound very happy to see me. It's kind of sad that outside of this upcoming remake, Konami really hasn't done much with these games over the years outside of this HD collection. But at least I can end it on a positive note, acknowledging the effort that the actual fans have put into that enhanced edition for Silent Hill 2. It's ridiculous. Couldn't possibly be true. So I don't know, maybe it's a good thing that we didn't get a HD collection for that first game. What is this? What's going on here? Well, having said that, that pretty much brings us to the end of the video. When am I gonna wake up? I reckon I've probably about tapped out the well here on the whole worst ways to play good games thing. But if you can think of any other games that might be worth covering, well, be sure to let me know in the comments section below. And as always, thanks for watching.